Hey guys, welcome in. It is Cole's Corner here on 93.7 The Fan on our YouTube page. And you're probably wondering, well, what the heck is that? Who is this person talking right now? My name is Matt Cole. I produce the Fan Morning Show, also host the early morning show from 5 to 5.40. That's Monday through Friday. And what is Cole's Corner? Cole's Corner is just going to be, my vision for this is to have athletes, former athletes, coaches, former coaches on here to talk about specific moments from their careers that you all remember. And they, we watched it, but these guys, they lived it. And so I wanted to have these folks on to give their perspective and have a fun conversation about it. So with that, I bring in a man who really needs no introduction. He's from Pine Richland. Drafted 11th overall, first round, 2004 MLB draft by the Pittsburgh Pirates. 12-year Major League Baseball career helped bring winning baseball back to the city of Pittsburgh, which is no small feat, as we know. It is Neil Walker. Neil, thanks so much for taking the time out. How are you, man? You got it, Matt. No problem. I'm doing great. How about yourself? Very, very good. So, Neil, I wanted to bring you on today because... It's the start of the baseball season, and to be honest with you, you're an opening day hero. You <laughs> thrived opening a season with a bang, and both times you did it against the Chicago Cubs, which made it, I think, a little bit sweeter for a lot of people. And so I'll, I'll go through both of those moments, both in 2011, and then we'll swing back around to 2014 at home as well. So we'll go back into the further back machine in 2011. Wrigley Field, it's April 4th. It's Chicago in early April, so it's miserable and cold and rainy. First of all, how difficult is that to just to play baseball in conditions like that? Yeah, well, I think when you look at the schedule, when it comes out, you know, whatever that is, around the New Year or something like that, or even in the, maybe in the late fall, uh, you're like, you're just kind of crossing your fingers and hoping that you're in Los Angeles or Arizona or Texas for the, those first couple of weeks of, 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 uh, of April, because you know that the, it's just going to be a coin flip, whether it's going to be 45 and, and, and drizzling or, you know, decent weather. Well, you know, in our division, obviously, most of all the places outside of Milwaukee that you could play on opening day are going to be outside of the elements. So most of the time we were playing somebody, either Cincinnati. It seemed like every year it was either Cincinnati or Chicago. And then a couple St. Louis sprinkled in here and there, but, um, that particular opening day was special for me because the year before I didn't get up permanently until mid-May. Uh, so that was my first opening day and it was one of 10, I believe for myself. So, you know, throw, throw out the weather for that day. Although just for the record, I think it was like 39 or 40 degrees in, in raining. I mean, my, my, my wife tells the story better of, of them sitting in the stands because you're moving around the dugout, you got heaters, you're out of the field, you're covered up. But she tells that people, you know, girls are holding their beers and stuff, and they're starting to frost a little bit. Like, <laughs> this is football weather, not baseball weather. But, um, yeah, th that was a particular day where, where you know, you, you know both teams are dealing with the, with the elements. Uh, you know it's going to kind of be a grinded-out game, and you hope that you don't get jammed uh, in the game or hit a ball on the end of the bat because it, it may – your hands may be rained for the next several hours. Uh, but – that day turned out to be obviously a really, really cool day for me, but obviously a day that we started off on the right foot with a, with a victory. Yeah. So I'll go to the moment. It's the top of the fifth pirates are down two nothing base is loaded two outs. Ryan Dempster is on the mound. And I mean, I know you're a professional Neil, obviously, but when the bases were loaded, did that change anything for you mentally? No, no, not really. I mean, you know, you try to remind yourself as a hitter that, like, you know, any opportunity, even with two outs, bases loaded, you have, you know, you, you got the pitcher on the ropes because he's one bad pitch away from the bases being cleared or even a, a base hit to score two and keep a rally alive. So, uh, in that particular instance, I remember, uh, I remember thinking, okay, we finally got a, we finally got a shot here. I step in the box. I think I took a strike, uh, fouled off a couple pitches, took a couple pitches. Dempster was pretty much throwing sinker slider occasional change up in there to some lefties I knew he didn't want to walk me I'm pretty sure it was like a seven or eight or nine pitch at bat yeah. and you know when you get to that point you get to three two two outs I think it was two outs maybe one out two outs and um 
and you know he doesn't want to walk you. So <clears throat> you're kind of in swing mode already, three, two, two outs, bases loaded. And, but it's not going through your head that you're trying to you're trying to hit something out of the stadium. You're just trying to make sure you swing at a strike and you use the big part of the field. And that was kind of always my mindset in general. And all of a sudden he throw, he kind of throws a little two seamer that just runs right back to the middle of the plate. And I remember my eyes kind of lighting up like, no way this is happening. <laughs> Hit it. And there was a breeze, there was a breeze blowing directly to right center field too that day, even though it was 40 degrees outside. And that thing just took off. And I was like, we were looking for it. I was like, oh, this is, please, just please get out. And then I, I looked at the flagpoles out of the corner of my eye and I was like, oh man, this thing's going to be way out of here. And it ended up, I believe, bouncing and then going onto, onto, onto the street. So, you know, not only was it a, is it a cool moment because it, I think it was the first, obviously the first runs we scored in the year, it kind of made everybody else just relax a little bit because opening day, the first series is always kind of stressful, especially for hitters, because you're trying to just, let me just get that first hit out of the way. Let me get that first defensive play out of the way. And then we're good. You know, you don't even, doesn't really even comprehend in your mind that there's 162 games, 161 left. So that particular moment, that's kind of how that whole thing unfolded. It's funny. I, I just watched the clip of that going into this interview and I thought, all right, maybe I'm going to have to remind him of some details here, but it, <laughs> you nailed it, man. They got it pretty much everything down from that. <laughs> and, that. and I don't blame you for it. That's something that's got to stick in your mind. Yeah. 92 mile per hour fastball. I assume maybe it was a sinker. Who yeah. knows? Just left it right over the middle of the plate and you crushed it. And so that was, that made it four to two pirates won six, three that day. You mentioned the win. How much was that a factor playing it at Wrigley? You hear about it all the time. You got to watch what the wind, where the wind is and everything. But was that like a, not only game to game, but like inning by inning, you're checking to see where the wind's blowing there? Yeah. And the rule of thumb for, especially the infielders, but the outfielders too, is uh, you always wanted to look at the, at the flag, especially in places like Wrigley, uh, San Francisco. Um, you can kind of throw the south side of Chicago in there too, although it's kind of enclosed there were a handful of places that you knew the wind kind of swirled. So you had to be checking the wind, especially on defense, just inning by inning by inning, because it could, like you said, it could change every, every single, every 10 minutes. So you're looking up there and I always wore, I always wore clear, clear glasses in, in Chicago and in, in San Francisco. And I know that looks silly, but it actually helped me because guys would be sitting there in the batter's box and all they'd be doing is blinking. And, uh, and they'd be like, why do you wear those glasses? And I was like, well, I just watched you blink like 30 times in the last minute. If you wear these, especially, at least when you're in the field, not necessarily in the batter's box, it's going to help you. They were wind protectors. So I always try to wear them in Chicago. But it was always down the lines that were the issue. It wasn't really in the, the middle of the field. But, uh, you know, every time you went to Chicago, you were, as a hitter, you were, you were crossing your fingers when you got off the bus and looking for the flags and hoping that they were going to dead center because that, that meant there was probably most likely going to be uh, a handful of home runs hitting that in that particular game. Anybody else copy your swag there for the clear glasses? Did anybody catch <laughs> on with it? A couple of guys wore them. I mean, a couple of guys stole them a few times because <laughs> they, they were like, oh, I'm standing in the outfield and I'm just blinking. And I'm like, well, you maybe you should have been a little more, more prepared. Sorry. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> but guys, guys over the course of time, you know, some of the young guys, I would just be like, dude, just get, just get a pair of clear glasses. It doesn't matter if they're Oakley's or they're Under Armour or they're Nike's. Like, because who cares if you're wearing them in the outfield or, or, or in the field? It's not. It's a little bit different wearing them in the batter's box because you really don't want anything to screw your view. But that was kind of my philosophy. Yeah. And whether it helped me or not, I don't know. But that was my rule of thumb in Chicago and, and San Francisco was wear some clear glasses or, or, or glasses on a day game. So that's funny that you say they, they aren't. Who cares if they're Nikes or Under Armors or whatever? Did, did guys care about that a lot? Like, hey, if, if I'm wearing something, it's got to be it's got to be a Nike or it's got to be well, whatever. Yeah, I mean, if it was, if, for instance, if it was like Andrew, he he was bought, he was he was really bound to to Nike, so they would want him to wear that. Oakley was kind of its own entity, so they, it was really like what would happen with Oakley in spring training. A guy would come around literally with like this gigantic bag and backpack. And he would replace your last year's uh, glasses for this year. Mm. So you stand in a line. It didn't really, you know, it didn't really matter if you were a 10 year vet or you were a rookie, you'd stand in a line and you'd wait for this guy and, and you'd say, Hey, these, these are scratched. Can I get them, re, uh, you know, fixed up? Can I get a, a, a gold uh, O on the side too? Can you replace that? And sometimes he could, and sometimes he couldn't, but that was always, uh, I always liked Oakley and I, I wore Under Armour for most of my career. So I, I'd wear some Under Armour stuff too, but the Oakley, most guys would kind of 
uh, wear Oakley, but if you were getting Buku bucks, like somebody like Andrew, you were probably having to wear Nike if you wore sunglasses. So yeah, there was more on the line for him. I'm sure yeah. the <laughs> yeah. brand aware, I guess. Uh, so, just, about, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so to wrap up the 2011 part of this discussion, that was Clint Hurdle's first year, right? As yep. the manager of the Pirates. And so what was, what were some of your first impressions of him when he walked through those doors? How did things change? Well, his voice was, was, was much louder than John Russell's. I can tell you that. <laughs> hey, it didn't take much. Any, anybody that, that had met, has met both of those guys would know that that's, that's numero uno. And, but he was, he was great for us because it was, you know, outside of his actual big personality and big demeanor, he was, he was so good at kind of rallying the troops and motivating us and keeping us on, on track. And as a young group, a young core, we needed that. We were building, we, we had a couple pieces in place. Uh, we knew there were some, some guys coming up and Marte and uh, Polanco was a little bit further down the line, but we knew we had some guys that could really play that were coming. Um, so he, 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 his job was to kind of keep us motivated, keep us moving. There was a lot of losing that was going on in 11, 12, uh, 10, 9, 10, and 11. In 12, we had a good half of the year, and then the back half of the year was not good. And then all of a sudden, boom, 13, we, we, we put it all together. Um, but he would just that, – that I remember the first, first spring training meeting, he came in, and he just was like, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to play hard. We're going to communicate. We're going to work together. There's not going to be any, any, any eyes in this thing. It's going to be a group effort and we're going to write this ship. And, you know, guys are looking around and, and, and they're going, yeah, we, we feel the same way. You know, hopefully we can, hopefully these pieces can kind of all come together. And like I said, that, that three year uh, mark going into 2013 and then 2013, we're looking around and we're going, Whoa, we got some, we got some guys that can play in this locker room. we got some uh, reinforcements from some veteran guys that, that came in and, uh, you know, Liriano and, and AJ Burnett and Russell Martin and some of these guys were like, man, we got a chance to be pretty special. And obviously the history is, is, is known for 13, 14 and 15. But, you know, Clint was Clint was a huge part of, of, of the, keeping us on track and keeping us motivated. And, um, you know, it was never a negative thing with him. Everything that, that we talked about and we did, uh, even if he had to reprimand somebody, it was it was from a place of positivity. And how do we grow and how do we get better as individuals? Yeah. Yeah, and I know that I said this was the last question about 2011, but I got to follow up with this. You're talking about just that whole process of becoming a winning baseball team and how Clint was instrumental in that. But for you personally, I mean, you're the you're the kid from Pittsburgh, right? Who's now playing for the Pirates and you're one of the faces of the franchise. How'd you deal with all of that pressure as you're trying to build the team and also build your own career? I, I do think I will say I would never I, – I, I, I never, obviously, nobody would ever want to be on a team that was not winning or struggling. Yeah. But I think that the development, especially at the major league level, for instance, I've always thought that being a young guy, being a rookie in New York or Boston or Philly was probably one of the hardest things, at least in baseball. It was, it was really very difficult to get set, settled because you get to the big leagues, you got your, everything is new. You're going to new ballparks. You're staying in new hotels. You're not familiar with a lot of stuff. And you're also trying to perform and you're, they want it now. I mean, you're on the Yankees, you're a rookie. They want it now. They want you to perform now. Well, you know, that wasn't the case when I got up in the end of 2009, 2010, it was a, it was a growing, it, there were some experiments. They were trying out, giving guys opportunities, a lot like what's going on right now. And so for me, I knew that there was a little more added, added stress to, to kind of the whole situation with people asking for tickets and, and preparing yourself and learning to, to play in the big leagues and hoping that I was good enough to play there, even though I did believe that I could. Um, but I think maybe I was just dumb enough to, to not really worry about those things. And I'd always kind of been a, you know, blinders on, go to the field, check off my, my list of the things I have to do for the day and then go play. Like that was always my, my mindset and mantra. And, and that helped me a lot in Pittsburgh. And that helped me a lot in New York when I went there for the first time, going from a small market to a gigantic market market. Because, you know, in today's day and age you're, you're, where they're, everything's on Instagram, everything's on Twitter, everything, everything's everywhere. You know, if somebody says something bad about you, you, you can find it. And oh, for, for sure. me, it was like, you know, I got to New York and I remember asking David Wright, like, you got any advice just in general? And he's like, yeah, don't turn on the radio and don't, and <laughs> don't, don't get on a social media platform. And luckily that was, you know, that was the, the, 
the 2000, whatever it was, 15, 16, 17, where the social media was still big, but it wasn't as gigantic as it was. So I didn't have any issues with that. Uh, but it came, like I said, it came with some, some, some struggles. The, the, the 530 calls from buddies for tickets that night, like that was, that was something that I had to get a handle on. So I would, you know, after batting practice, I would call my wife, my girlfriend at the time, uh, text people back if I had to. And then like my phone was off at 530 because I was like, I, I got to get ready. Like I got to get ready for the game. I can't have these distractions. Like hopefully these people understand. <laughs> right. That slowed down a little bit once you left Pittsburgh, I'm sure. As far yeah. as he's hitting you up. Yeah, yeah, I did. And, and even even as time kind of went along, I got a stranglehold. The, 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 the PR department helped me out. The, the front office guys kind of helped me out, trying to not put too much on, on, on my plate. And, um, and that really helped. And then when I went to New York, the only people that recognized me in Manhattan were, 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 people, were Pirates fans. So, you know, and I was living in the same building as Jacob DeGrom, David Wright. So it wasn't, you know, when I was walking my dog, they weren't concerned about me. They were waiting. You know, somebody around the corner knew that that David or or, uh, or Jacob Degrom might come walking by, so they had no concerns about me. <laughs> this is off script once again, but I got to ask this too. You played for both the Mets and the Yankees later. Yeah. What, what were some of the differences there between being a, a Met and and being a Yankee, even in the same city? I mean, different parts of the city, but how was that different? It was. I mean, it was both both organizations were very similar as far as their desire to win, uh, the uh, putting together rosters, sparing no expense. You know, at the time that I was there, you had a Cespedes was there. Uh, DeGrom was coming into his own. David Wright was kind of heading out the door. Um, they, Curtis Granderson was there. We had some really good players, but also some really highly, highly paid players in both places. But it just seemed like, you know, what could go wrong went wrong in, in with the Mets. Like mm. the, the two years I was there, I had a freaky injury that knocked me out for, for eight weeks. Uh, DeGrom, going into the playoffs the year before, I was having a career year offensively. My back goes out, and I have to get surgery. DeGrom hurts his elbow. Uh, you know, David Wright's back is, is, is jammed up. And it was almost like there, there was some sort of kind of black cloud that was, mm. that was just constantly there. And even, even now, look, I mean, the last week and a half, you saw DeGrom's going to be out for a little bit, and Scherzer may not be out. It's just weird. And I don't, you know, the fan base is fantastic, but you also kind of got this sense when you were, were playing uh, in at City Field too. You you kind of hear groans and things like that. It was almost like the Mets fan base, to a degree, was kind of was sitting there almost waiting for things not to go well. Whereas on the yeah. other side, um, they were people. They were expect, they were coming to the ballpark. If you had a ten game homestand, you were expected to go ten and zero. And if you went nine and zero and got blown out the tenth game. You're, you're, the whole place is booing you, you know what I mean? And, and that's, that's just what you had to understand. It was just the market. It was just the media. It was uh, the expectations, all those things. So the expectations were the same on both sides of town. It was just a very – it was a, di a little bit different feeling from uh, a standpoint of, like, um, you know, what could go wrong, what, what possibly could go wrong did go wrong with the, with the Mets and on the Yankee side – it, it just seemed like things were a little bit more smooth sailing. So moving back to the opening day moments, uh, the one that I know people remember, and that was the home opener at PNC Park 2014. I remember it well personally because I was in the stands on the third baseline. Fantastic moment. Stadium erupts. You know, finally, it was it was even better because that game was such a slog up to that point. Yeah scoreless pitchers duel which i appreciate you know as a baseball fan but it was like you know by that time 10th inning yep. can somebody score here and <laughs> weather surprisingly for pittsburgh yeah. yeah nice and sunny a lot yeah. different than than chicago and this was after this is 2014 so this is after you guys broke through in 2013 was there any kind of change to to mindset or or culture heading into that year because you had experienced all that in 13 the, yeah, I mean, the bar had definitely been raised. The bar had been raised. We had a lot of the same type of faces there. We had uh, some guys in different roles. I think, I think Sean Rodriguez, that was the year he came in, maybe Gabby Sanchez as well. So there were a couple of guys that were uh, big parts of our team, but not, not necessarily like, right, you know, big, big name uh, players. And, um, and so like you said, that, that day was, 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 was warm and it was just a terrible game. 
And the one thing, the one thing as players, especially uh, if you play a lot of day games, you, you're, you're always concerned about that three o'clock to five o'clock window as a hitter, because you never know how the shadows are going to be. Well, in April, the shadow, the, the sun goes down a little bit, a little bit quicker than it does obviously in June and July. And in Pittsburgh, if it's, and, and luckily the sun is rarely ever out here in Pittsburgh. Right? <laughs> yeah. if, if, if you get one of those rare four o'clock games or your one o'clock game goes really long or it's an extra innings and there's no clouds in the sky and it's, and it's sunny out, you can't see. Like it's, it's really, really difficult to see the ball, the spin. You can see hard, soft, but you can't see spin. And uh, I believe the guy that was pitching that 10th inning, Villanueva, he was kind of a fastball changeup guy. So I was like, all right, same, same type of scenario as 2011. I'm not really, cons- I'm just trying to get on base. But at the same time, you see the shadows starting to creep in. And I'm like, all right, this guy's going to go, he's going to go some sequence of fastball, fastball changeup. And I need to, I need to either look for one or the other. So I was like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to sit here and look and look for changeup. And if I get it, great. If I don't get it, I'm just going to try to battle when I get two strikes. And he throws me a changeup, and uh, I'm ready for it. I'm out in front. I kind of, I get it. I, I don't, I don't crush it, but I get it good enough with, with a good trajectory. And you know, my as a left-handed hitter at PNC Park, it was always just use that wall any way you can. Move up on the plate, move back a little bit, and just try to pull everything you can. And that was a, a fine example of that. But um, great way to start off the the, the season. Ballpark was, I remember, being completely packed. Like you said, the, the aura and the, uh, and the excitement rolled over from 2013 was, was obviously prevalent when we were there. And it just kind of kind of moved us in the right direction. So that was, you know, that was a lot of fun, too. Yeah, looking back at the video of that, too, Villanueva is out there. He's got like a Raleigh Fingers, like handlebar mustache, whatever. Yeah. It must have been just the thing that he tried out like very early on in that season. But obviously didn't look much like Raleigh Fingers. You made him look bad after hitting that walk-off homer. And it's funny that you say that you didn't really get it all that well because I look back on it, as soon as you hit that, Neil, your, your <laughs> arms went up in the air. Like, you knew that you got that. And you well, it, what's, fun, what's funny is that, um, like, you know, guys like Jordy Mercer and, and, uh, and Josh Harrison and, and Kutch, they, when I when when I started it, especially left-handed, started to use that raw wall really well. And this is something that I learned from Ryan. Ryan Domit passed this along to me when I got to big leagues. He said, "Hey, bro, I'm gonna give you some good advice, especially as a switch hitter." He's, he's like, "Use that wall okay? because you you may top spin some balls that that hit the wall. You may hit some balls that flare up there and they just sneak into the into the stands." And I and I made sure that I did the the, the same thing to with Josh Bell when I kind of left and mm-hmm. and he was in the minor leagues. And I said, I'm going to give you some advice that I gave you, especially as a switch hitter. Use that wall. And if in right-handed, if you can kind of stay to the middle of it, just stay away from left field. Whatever you do, stay away from left, left center field at PNC Park. And so they would always joke with me because I said I had a, I had a tax on the first row of the Clemente wall, the seats, because I hit so many balls that just, that just went over. <laughs> and so every time I would hit a homer over there, if it would just sneak over, I'd come in the dugout and I'd be like, who's paying my tax? Who's paying my tax? <laughs> <laughs> hey, all counts the same. All shows up on the box score the same way. That's right. Use that. Absolutely. <laughs> the question, when you hit a, a walk-off, okay, yeah. I don't know why I thought about this, but I've never, I played baseball growing up, never hit a, hit a, hit a walk-off, certainly not a walk-off homer. You're rounding third, okay? Everybody's there waiting at the plate. <laughs> is there any kind of moment there where you're thinking like all right what am I about to experience here like how many gut punches am I going to get how many slaps to the head are they going to try to rip my shirt off like wh- what's happening here well that's why that's why most people take their helmets off because yeah there's always four or five guys and, and on that team I remember Travis Snyder just beat the crap out of me I mean just, <laughs> just kidney punches and gut punches and and you hit home and your helmet's off and anybody that's that's kind of worn one of those especially the, the the major league helmets that they're really hard. And so if somebody, if somebody gives you a slap to it, it's actually hurts worse than having, than, than somebody hitting you in the head for whatever reason, just because yeah. it's heavy, whatever it's made up. Um, but you know, they, they always, we always joke. Another joke is just like, well, if you're man enough to hit a walk off in the big leagues, you're man enough to just take a beating. So, you know, <laughs> whether they rip your shirt off, uh, you know, if you, 
if you're if you're eight eight packed up and ha- and, and ripped, you know, got, maybe they don't care if, if if they rip your shirt off. You know, they weren't going to rip my shirt off. I know that, but <laughs> I knew take a beating and and uh, you know you're getting the Gatorade at some point. So if if you like your shoes and your gloves or something, try to get rid of them before you do the post game interview because you know you're going to get red Gatorade dumped on you and, and all your stuff is going to be ruined. Um, but like I said, there's there's not many sweeter moments in, in any sport than than ending a game that way because like you said, there's 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 no time limit. So it's like you know you, you get one and it's you get one in in the in, with the first pitch in the in the bottom of the ninth in the tie game, game's over. Like go home. When did that trend start, by the way, ripping off the shirt? How know. did that become a thing? I don't know. I mean, I assume that I assume that like they you kind of you kind of pick guys in the clubhouse, especially the guys that are more ripped than the rest of them. Yeah. And, you know, because sometimes you'll tell guys like, you know, you, you hit you hit a walk off like I'm, I'm going to I'm you know, we're going to put a bucket together full of seeds and gum and like the grossest stuff and dump it on you. And guys are like, come on, we can be a little bit, you know, better than that. I don't want to smell like dill pick seeds going home, you know. But uh, typically outside of Polar Bear Pete, who I've seen get his shirt ripped off, and it's not exactly the, the, <laughs> the greatest the greatest view of all time. But, you know, to each his own. He's got he, – he, he led the league in homers one year. Yeah, so. he hits bombs. So whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like that had to start with somebody actually requesting that. Like, hey, if I if I get one here, it'd be all right if you guys took my shirt off. I could show off a little bit. There's no other way that came to be. I, no, I, yeah, you're right. There's no other. <laughs> Where's that one rank among the most memorable memorable moments of your career? The, the walk off there in 14. Well, I think I think that in particular, I mean that that 2014 season from a personal standpoint was was my best season of my career and. I guess you could say of my, of my life, I want, I want a silver slugger. Uh, I had an appendectomy in, in, I think, early June that probably cost me making the all-star team, uh, which was a bummer. But, you know, to be honest, I would rather have the silver slugger than, than the all-star game appearance. So, uh, but, you know, to be, to be honest, that was, that, was, that was a big stepping stone for me as far as uh, confidence and knowing that I can be a middle of the order player in the big leagues. and. Um, I did it. I did it obviously earlier in my career, but typically I was either hitting in front of Andrew or behind Andrew. And um, so that kind of that year kind of at least solidified me into being that that two five hitter in the lineup, I guess you could say. So uh, but, you know, I was never for me and my my mentality was never really about it was never about the individual stuff. It was, you know, we knew what we were building. 13 was was an awesome year. We knew we had to play well, especially in our division in 14 to get back to where we were. And I mean, I think that was a year we damn near won hundred games and we still were in the wild card. So yeah. um, that was, un- that was kind of unfortunate uh, uh, piece of, of those three years was that we had to pay- play in the, in the wild card three games and face two guys that were having just monster, monster, monster seasons on the mound. Yeah, that, that 15 season in particular, the, the 98 wins, I think the Cardinals had 99 that year. That was just so gut wrenching to go through a season, win ninety eight games, <laughs> and you're still in the one game wild card against Jake Arrieta, who was a freaking machine at that point, was just unreal. And I, I still contend. I tell my buddies this all the time. We have conversations about you know the the glory years there, the the playoff baseball where if that fifteen team just gets past the Cubs, yeah. They they've got a shot to win it all. I truly truly believe if you get into a series with that team, there's you could have beat anybody that year. Well, we felt we felt really good about our our chances, and you know the one thing that the one thing that was a big deal that people kind of lost uh, forgot about was the fact that we gambled on the last game of the season in Cincinnati with Garrett Cole pitching. Yeah, knowing that if we didn't win and the Cardinals didn't lose. And if that scenario did happen, we would have had to go to St. Louis to play for the NL Central title. So we rolled the dice and Johnny Cueto just went out, another guy that was just blowing people away at that time, and he shoved it. And we lost Cole. We, we, we have to go play in a wild card game, and we lost Cole for that game. And Edison Volquez was fantastic that year. But uh, I believe that's who pitched that year, right? Was that Volquez who pitched that year or Liriano? Um, it might have been Cole. I don't know, actually. 13 was definitely Liriano. Um, yeah. 
14, I believe, was Volquez against the Giants, right? That, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And so 15 was... 15, I, I believe, was Cole. You're right. Okay, so then that, so that was in 14 then. Yeah. Where we have Cole. Okay. Right. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah, Garrett wasn't there because he got... He got uh, he got stung by a couple a couple home runs yep. in that game, and like you said, Arietta was beyond lights out. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think at one time when I so when I left when I left Pittsburgh, I had those three wild card games, and then when I went to the Mets, we played in the wild card game, but I wasn't available. And then my first year in New York, we played the wild card game. So the first the first six years of of the wild card system, I played in five of those games. And so what are saying, your thoughts about the wild card game, Neil? And that, yeah, that's and that was the and that was like every every time the media would come in before those, I'd be like, all right, here we go. Do, yeah. they want to talk? How do you prepare for this and that? And it's just like it's you throw everything out the window because it's one game. Like right. you know, you wish that it was three games and you know that so that it's a little more fair because like you said, if you don't have your your ace out there or you know. Crawford hits a, a grand slam uh, in the whatever the fifth, sixth inning of, yeah. of the game against uh, uh, Volquez, and that game was over. Like the game, the game mostly over. Somebody hits a three run or a grand slam uh, in the wild card game. So, um, but it seems like things are trending in the right direction as far as that's concerned with, within Major League Baseball. So it'll be fun to watch, kind of how how many more teams are are involved coming down the stretch, and, and how many teams will will push the chips in to to see if they can't, you know. Get a, get a chance because that's all you want. You want to get into those five game series and those seven game series because right. then it's then it, the playing field is even. Yeah, I've all. I mean, maybe I've just because I was a jaded Pirates fan, but I've always thought that that was the one game wild card. I mean, there's no other time in baseball that you play one team for one game. Right. Right. So why are we doing it in the postseason? <laughs> I know. Sense to me. <laughs> so there you go, Neil, walk off hero in your career. Right now, you're working for games for AT and T Sportsnet as a broadcaster, uh, doing Pirates games. How, how's that been so far? How's that experience been for you? You know, it's been good. It, you know, I knew, I knew when, when I was done that we, I was going to be living in the in this Pittsburgh area. I knew that uh, I wanted to stay involved to some capacity uh, within baseball. I knew I didn't. I knew at least uh, off the jump that I had no interest in coaching because, you know, coaching the timing the time frame for coaching is essentially worse than than playing. I mean, the coaches are there for a seven o'clock game at like eleven noon, and they don't leave until almost midnight. So. Uh, this is a, I think this is a really, this is a happy medium. This is something that I enjoy. I enjoy watching baseball. I enjoy talking about baseball. I enjoy analyzing baseball. Um, but it's also not on a huge scale. It'll be about, you know, six games a, a, a month, which is, uh, like I said, with, with having a five-year-old and a two-year-old at the house, uh, it gives us the freedom to kind of get me back on a normal, like normal human being schedule after, you know, 20 years of baseball, uh, give me the freedom to, to, and still stay involved in baseball, but also not miss those those moments uh, with my kids. So um, I'm looking forward to it, and I'm, and I'm hoping that it goes really well. Uh, and I'm hoping that you know eventually I'll, I'll do a little bit more, and, and I'll be able to kind of be involved uh, uh, to a higher capacity. But for this time, I'm having fun doing the doing the morning show with you guys, doing the uh, the, the Pirates games broadcast, TV and radio, and uh, playing some golf here and there. So that's. Uh, <laughs> All those things are, are pretty good. I'm a pretty lucky guy. Yeah, yeah. Nice plug there for the morning show. We do talk to Neil uh, once. Probably we'll talk to him what, once a week, right? During the baseball season, he'll hop on and, and talk baseball with us. So definitely looking forward to that on 93.7 The Fan. And give give me one thing now. Put your, your analyst hat on, Neil, for a second. Okay. Give me one thing as a Pirates fan coming into this season that I should look out for or look forward to this year. I think, I think a victory – at the end of this season and, you know, I don't consider myself the, the, the Kool-Aid drinker or somebody that loves to hear the word rebuilding, all that stuff. I, I, I can't stand it. Um, but where the Pirates are now, if, if at the end of the year you have your, you have most of your, your fielding spots, most of your defensive players, if six of those guys are, are somewhat regular, or I'll even say five of those guys, five of your eight guys can solidify themselves as everyday players or close to everyday players. I think that's a victory uh, because when you look at it now, you got, you got uh, Brian Reynolds, you got key Brian Hayes that are, that are uh, 
obviously the not going anywhere. Ben Gamble is going to be playing a lot of left field, but he may not play against left-handers. Kevin Newman is somebody that is a tremendous shortstop, but this is this is a huge year for him. I mean, he's this is, in my opinion, this is, this is make or break. He has the opportunity if he goes out there and he plays really well and he can be a guy that hits two or seven in, in, in the lineup or, or eight. He can be, in my opinion, a, a Jordy Mercer type or stick him at the bottom of the lineup. We don't really care what he does off the, all that much offensively, but we know he's going to make every play at, at shortstop. And if, if guys like O'Neill Cruz can come up, whether whatever position he plays, it doesn't matter in my opinion. I mean, the guy can play short, left, right, center. He's, he's athletic enough to play them all. But I think, of, like I said, a victory, in my opinion, would be at least on the offensive side of things, you go into next year and you say, okay, we have three positions that we need to platoon. And, and you can kind of throw catcher out of a mix. So if you can have your second baseman shortstop, third baseman, center fielder, and left fielder, you're, you're done. At the end of the year, you know going into next year, you got these guys and you got them for, we'll call it the foreseeable future, three, four years because of their, their contract status. Then you can deal with these other positions much, much more efficiently. You got a platoon them, you platoon them. You go out in, in, in free agency and grab a bigger name, fantastic. And once you can get these pieces set in stone, uh, a little bit more clearly, that's when you start to, to, to pull the pieces in and, and start to, to really, really build. And when guys at the major league level, when, when the game of, of, of just surviving is done, when, when you're no longer at the big leagues and you're trying to survive, you're trying to thrive, you're trying to, you know, you're trying to put up, put up numbers, but you're also trying to win and you know that you can be one of the top, you know, 10 players at your position. That's when things get fun because you're not, you don't, this, you see the game much differently when you're, when you're not trying to survive. And a lot of times that happens between year two and three. And that's why it'll be a big year for guys like, like Key Bryan to, to, number one, stay healthy, uh, but to, to get 500 plus of bats. Uh, you know what you're going to get from Brian Reynolds if he's healthy. But um, Newman is, is, in my opinion, is, is, a, is a big, big piece. Because, like you said, if he has a good year and they don't want to, and they don't want to keep him, he, but he's still a, a solid defensive player. You might be able to get something for him. He, he, he goes out and has a big year. You're able to keep him. Shortstop or a premium. And then you don't really, maybe you don't have to go through the growing pains with O'Neill Cruz as a shortstop in the major leagues. But you're, if you're solid up the middle, if you're solid in center, second and short, and obviously a catcher, that's, that's when you can start to, to build around. But, you know, the pieces are there. It's, it's early. The pieces are there. I'm, I'm an eternal optimist, especially as it comes to, uh, to baseball. And, God you know, <laughs> yeah, you, can, you can see, you can see that, you know, of course, people aren't happy about O'Neill Cruz going down. And, and, and neither was I. But the, where, where they're at right now, the, the vision, at least, is, is clear. And uh, even though sometimes they may not say it, you kind of understand where things are going and uh, outside of injuries or setbacks to guys, you hope that, that guys can solidify themselves and uh, as big league players. And then the organization can kind of take off from there. Where do you think O'Neill Cruz fits in? Man, I don't know. Like, like when I, when I look at him and, and I see him move, he moves so well, obviously I see it, with the swing, I see a little bit of a younger Polanco. Yeah. Uh, Obviously, he's a left-handed thrower. I think that the arm plays everywhere. I think it plays in right, left, center, shortstop, third base even. I think that he wants to play the premium positions. I think he wants to play set, uh, shortstop and maybe not necessarily center, but center and left field at, at, at PNC Park are essentially the same thing. Um, but he has the tools to play eight, uh, seven positions on, 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 the, on the baseball field. So, you know, if, if you, you know this guy's going to be – a mainstay in the lineup for many years to come. So you hope that this send down and whether it's, it's one of these things where he plays three games in a row at left field down in Indy, three games in right field, three games in center, three games in short, and just keeps bouncing around and they're kind of throwing things against the wall. You hope from a development standpoint that that really helps him. And you hope that he continues to improve offensively. And, uh, but you watch, you watch the swing, you watch the, the hit ability, you watch all, you watch him move. I mean, the sky's the limit for guys like this. I mean, the, the labels that you put on guys like this, you, you don't you don't want to put them in the same category as some of the guys that, that you're saying. But at the same time, you're seeing the hard hit. You're seeing the, the, the average hard hit contact. 
you're seeing the, the movement down the first base. You're seeing the way he moves in the field. He's proven he can handle himself at this point. So, you know, the last thing to do is, is to send him to the Wolves and let him go. And whether that's in uh, April, May, June, you know, who knows. But you hope that that's another guy that can get up and solidify himself and he can get himself 250, 350, 450 big league bats this year, and then he's off to the races. How about that breakdown? Neil Walker, that's why he's in the booth, folks. He just broke it all down right there for the Pittsburgh Pirates. <laughs> that was awesome stuff. Neil, thanks so much for taking the time out today. Really appreciate it. And to go over some, some of the highlights, some of the big moments from your career as we kind of approach the, the beginning of the season and opening day. Uh, enjoy the season. Enjoy everything that you'll be involved in this year. Again, looking forward to you joining the Fan Morning Show throughout the, the baseball season as well. And enjoy every moment of it, man. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on, Matt. Always enjoyable to talk to you and talk baseball. And yeah. uh, look forward to hearing more of your guests on, the, on Cole's Corner moving forward. So good luck. Thanks, Neil. Appreciate it, man. All right, you got it.